Uh, you set the theme uh, with love, so I'll start out by saying that I love to share. Um, but one thing about sharing, um, sharing is fun, sharing makes you happy, sharing is good for society, but sharing is also good for business. And I want to talk a little bit about sharing. Um, one of the things that's very important to, to remember is that a lot of the technologies that we've had recently, the Industrial Revolution, mass production and distribution of both physical things and content, has made it life a lot easier for us in many ways, but it hasn't made sharing easier. In fact, it's made sharing more difficult. And one of the things, the reason why most of us are here today is because of the internet. And I think the internet is actually one of the first uses of our technology that has made it easier to share. And actually, sharing is the key to making the internet important. And um, because I'm a geek, I look at things in terms of this stack. And some of you have, made, have seen the stack before. But this is a, a, a technology stack. So if you look at the bottom, Ethernet is the thing that we use to connect computers together. TCP IP, which is the network protocol of the internet, is what we use to connect our network together. The World Wide Web, HTTP, is what we use to connect our web pages together. But I don't know how old everyone is here, but before the internet, um, we didn't have these things. And while it was technically possible to connect computers together, to make computers, to make a Minitel, it wasn't really cost effective. It was very difficult. What the internet has done has lowered the cost of doing things, and it has made possible the ability to connect things together. So a long time ago, before we had internet and before we even had ethernet, you had big systems, like uh, a big IBM system that did uh, payment systems, and you had a reservation system. And to connect them together, it would cost millions of dollars and years of work. And what happened is once we got these layers, and if you look at each of these layers, there are open specifications where anybody can participate that allows an interoperability, they're not proprietary. They're not owned by companies. So before we had internet, you would have Novell Networks, and you might have uh, you know, the IBM token ring. And you had all kinds of very smart, very fancy technologies. And the technology was quite sophisticated. But where we failed was that you couldn't interoperate. And the way that the interoperability worked was you, you created these standards that um, had no patents, that were organized and managed by a community. And it allowed an interoperability and, um, and, and things to connect together. Now, also, if you think about it, for instance, when the, uh, Tim Berners-Lee invented the web, he could have very easily patented it and tried to make a company and make a startup. But instead, by giving it away, he made it possible the ability to connect all these things together. Now, I don't know how many of you remember when the web first came out. But a lot of people said, well, why do we need the internet? Why do we need the web? I remember when I first got a demonstration of the World Wide Web, many people said, oh, well, we already have FTP and Gopher and internet. We can go to the university. We can with download the program. It's already connected together. Making it a little bit easier and a little bit simpler for the average person isn't going to make the world any better. Because they couldn't envision eBay, and they couldn't envision Wikipedia, and they couldn't envision Google. And each one of these layers, I will um, you know, make an assumption that most people, even myself, couldn't imagine all of the effects that each of these layers have caused. And in between each of these layers, you have an explosion of innovation, both nonprofit and for profit. So you have ISPs on top of TCPIP, and then you have Google. Now, you think about Google. We just had a panel discussion with Google. And imagine trying to make Google before the internet. So, first of all, the phone company would say, no, no, we do search, we'll do it in our RD lab. And we'll talk with all the other governments, and we'll come up with a protocol, and we'll come up with something under the UN that will do search. And the governments and the telephone companies would have made search. It would have taken years and years and years. It wouldn't have worked, and it would have cost millions of dollars. But instead, what happened was we had these stacks. So the, you know, Sergey and, and Larry were able at Stanford. The, so the first stand, the Google URL was google.stanford.edu. They just got a computer which was basically a, a basic computer. They got a bunch of free software, which was based on sharing. right? So they used probably Apache. They probably had Linux. They probably had all this open software. So probably for thousands of dollars, they made a box that before internet and open source would have cost millions. And then if you remember, before we had TCP IP, it would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees to figure out what the negotiation was, first of all. Because when the internet first came out, again, if you remember the legal guys, they kept saying the internet is illegal. In Japan, the professor said the internet is illegal because you can't connect to all these countries without bilateral agreements with all of them. 
So it would have either been legally impossible or cost impossible to have created Google before the internet. And so what the internet has allowed has allowed such a low cost of innovation and has caused interoperability and all these different things to happen that we would have had before. And I, I, I challenge you to try to remember before the internet if you would have predicted Google or Wikipedia. I think the answer is no. So what I'm going to assert is that there's actually another layer. So now that we're technically able to connect all these things together, we still fail at another layer, which is we fail at the legal layer. So while it's technically possible to share music, while it's technically possible for people to put together um, research works and for people to um, share photos and things like that, it's legally very, very difficult. If you're YouTube, you get sued for a billion dollars. If I want to go to the University of Tokyo and share a photograph with a curriculum in the University of Italy, I have to hire lawyers, and the legal fees cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the legal fees actually cost more than the value of the transaction. And this is exactly the same as the other layers, where technically it was possible to create a mini-tail if you had enough money. It just wasn't possible to do it effectively. And similarly, if you're a big media company and you have lawyers and you can fly to Cannes and drink champagne, it's OK. You can do sharing. You can do remix. But as an individual, with all of the cost savings that we have, all of the technical ability to connect things together, we fail at sharing, mostly because the legal system is too complicated and is kind of broken. And I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about transaction costs. This is a presentation that um, Clay Shirky gave uh, in 2006. But open source is also very important, because when we think about internet, when we think about the low cost of con connecting, low cost of open source software, all these things are very important. But another very important thing is the low cost of failure. Because if you're a big company and you're a big research facility and um, you're trying to create the next Google, probably if I were a big Japanese telephone company, I would spend $5 million trying to decide whether to make a Google. Then it would cost me $100 million to actually try to build the Google. And then I would fail. So the failure would cost about $100 million, I would guess. Now, as a startup company, um, you spend a little bit less. But getting back to my original point, I, I challenge you that most of the successful companies that we know today, you would not have predicted were, were, would have been successful. Most things are quite random. So what you're trying to do on the internet, since it's very hard to predict what's going to be successful, is to lower the cost of failure. And open source has one of the lowest costs of failures, as, as Clay Shirky will tell you. This is a site called SourceForge, where a lot of um, open source and free software is deposited. And if you look at the, some of the higher, this is the 100th percentile, game is downloaded you know, 12 million times. right? So the most successful software is very successful in the 100th percentile. But if you go down to the 99th percentile, you're down to a couple of thousand downloads total. And when you go down to the 75th or the 90th percentile, you're at the 10s. And when you get to the 70s, you're at zero. So you get a curve like this where only less than 1% of open source projects are successful in any way that we would count as successful. So most open source projects fail, but the cost of failure is nearly zero. So if you think that you had to do um, hundreds of projects and spend hundreds of million dollars per project to fail, you could never get the kind of innovation that we're getting now in open source. And open source and, and then venture-funded startups are both very, very low cost of failure. And that's why we get to keep swinging the bat at things. And we're not, I don't think we're smart enough now to centrally plan success. I think we have to plan for lowering the cost of failure, lowering the cost of co connection, and lowering the cost of um, communication. And you're lowering also the cost by creating competition. This is a very interesting post. This is the Usenet post when Linus announced he was starting Linux. Right? So this is a famous post from uh, 91. And he says, I'm doing a free operating system. It's just a hobby. Um, it won't be big and professional like GNU. Right? Now, there are th probably hundreds, maybe thousands of posts on Usenet that day saying, I'm going to start a project. Can somebody help me? Would a VC have funded this? No. Right? This is quite random. And the thing that's great about the internet is it allows something like this to have succeeded. This would not have run, worked as a proposal. McKinsey would have turned it down. And so in a sense, this is, this is the kind of bottom-up stuff that the internet allows. And getting back to my original discussion, so I think that right now we have a very friction-free system to 
cause low cost of innovation at all of the different layers except the content layer. And the content layer, what the problem is, is the copyright. And copyright is very much, I would call it, it's like sand in your Vaseline. So everything's very slippery, but there's one thing that keeps getting stuck, right? And so this is, a lo this is Lawrence Lessig's slides. And I'm, I'm remixed many of these slides. So it, Lloyd, you're laughing too much. <laughs> um, so if you imagine a book, there are several uses of the book. So most uses of a book are unregulated. Uh, you can read a book. You can give a book to somebody. You can sell a book. You can sleep on a book. None of these uses trigger any kind of restriction by the law. You're free to do this without regulation. And there are certain things with a book that you can't do, which is copy the book and sell it without permission. Right? And this used to be basically copyright in the old days. used to be something that big companies did to each other. But the average user that you would have before you had the copy machine, before you had the internet, had nothing to do with the average use of the book. And there was a small sliver of things you can do, like quote the book without um, asking permission. But most of the uses were free, and most of the regulated people in content were commercial entities. It was to prevent commercial exploitation of content by other companies. That's how copyright law was basically run until we had the internet. And you couldn't control it legally anyway. Even if I didn't want Loic to sleep by my book, it would be very difficult for me to enforce a law to prevent Loic from sleeping on my book. So those laws weren't even contemplated. So when analog went to digital, suddenly what happens, every time you open your browser and you look at something, you're making a copy. Every time I try to give a book, I'm making a copy. Every time I index a book, like Google tried to do, they're making a copy, and it triggers copyright law. So in the digital world, every single use is a copy, and every single use requires you to ask permission. So this is completely new. Before, none of us had to care about copyright. Suddenly, everybody is a copyright sort of regulated zone. So before, everything was unregulated. But now, most uses of content are regulated. And the other thing that's happening is control. So if you have a Kindle, I have a book. I can't give it to Loic because it's protected. Now they're saying, OK, in Japan, I can download a TV show to my hard disk, but I can only watch it 10 times, and it erases itself. So there's more and more control happening. And in fact, there are people now who are saying, well, you know, the secondhand bookstores in the real world, they don't pay us royalties, and they can give books to other people. Maybe we should start charging royalties for them. Right? So, so this kind of control that we had, we used to have a fear that the internet would destroy the content industry and there would be no control. Well, in fact, a lot of the digital technology is creating control, and it's actually creating friction. Because if you want to share, let's say I'm a book publisher, and I say, Loic, I'm happy for you to use my book. Or if, I'm, if I create a CD or DVD, and I said, Loic, can you please use that scene for my DVD? If Loic tries to remove that scene from the DVD, he has broken the digital copyright um, technology on the DVD and has, is an infringer of copyright, even though me, the copyright owner, said it's OK, just by circumventing the technology, the friction, he has uh, committed a crime. Now, the problem is there are a lot of legitimate mass production of content, mass distribution of content, real world content businesses who have legitimate rights to the content that they have. And they basically have all rights reserved. They know their, con their business and they want to keep their business model. That's fine. They're over there. On this side, we have a whole other group of people which I would call the abolitionists. These are the people, the pirates, who want to abolish copyright. And they want everything to be free. And that's a legitimate position which I don't share necessarily. But there's a whole bunch of people in between. Because I don't want everybody who wants to use my photo to ask me permission. I just want them to give me attribution. And Loic may not mind as long as you don't use it for commercial use. And everybody probably has some level of sharing they would, wouldn't mind happening if they didn't um, if the restrictions and the, uh, the permissions were, were, were held correctly. And so what we're trying to do is create a, a system that makes it easier to, for the people in between to express what they would like to do. And that's Creative Commons. It's co-founded co -founded by Lawrence Lessig. And it's a nonprofit organization, which I'm the CEO of right now. And we make, we're trying to make copyright and sharing easier. And what we're doing is first we create licenses, so copyright licenses, legal licenses. So basically, we found there's four different things that people care about. So one is most people want to get at attribution. So if you use my photo, um, you say that you, you use, it, it came from me. Some people care about whether the user is a commercial, uses it for commercial use. Some people don't. So that's one of the questions that we ask. 
The other one is some people don't mind if the result of the work that's sort of maybe remixed um, is shared back to them. Um, some people want it shared back to them. And then some people don't want derivative works, which means remix. So for instance, documentary producers, I find, don't like their story edited, whereas musicians love to have their music remixed. So, so these are the basic questions. And if you answer these questions, yes or no, you basically get six different licenses. And we're trying to keep it as simple as possible, but provide for every major difference in opinion in terms of the choice that people want to provide. And once you've selected a license, which you can, you can do on our website, but now you can also do inside of Flickr, you can do inside of Seismic, you just pull down the menu, and then you can select one of these, it produces a deed in your local language. So this tells you in, in 50 different languages um, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do, and if you're using it, what you're supposed to do. And it produces also a lawyer legal readable deed in 50 different jurisdictions that you can take to court and explain to lawyers what this deed actually means. And this is actually important because when I produce a television show and I want to use content from somebody's blog and I don't have time to ask them permission, but if I see the Creative Commons license, I can show the lawyers at the, at the broadcast company, oh, here's the license for this material. I don't have to ask permission. And the other thing that's very important is this is standardized. So once your lawyer reads it once, every single new Creative Commons license doesn't incur another legal fee. What? Five minutes. So, so this is important for lowering the legal cost. The other very important thing is that we have the W3C has made an official recommendation so that we have metadata around this that allows Google and all of the, your tools to track, um, track the copyright content on top of inside of the content. So I have five minutes, so I'm going to move quickly. So we're, we're in uh, 50 jurisdictions. We have paid people in 80. And we have 140 million works licensed under Creative Commons. So that's basically Creative Commons. I'm going to zip through a couple of examples. So Star Wreck is a movie. It's a Finnish movie. They released it under a Creative Commons license. Eight million people downloaded it. They gave it away for free. Suddenly, there were millions of fans. And then somebody gave them a DVD deal, and somebody started doing television. So it's sort of backwards. They shared first, and they got money later. Nine Inch Nails gave away their music in the Ghost album. And in this, they made a website, which basically they sold a $300 signed box set, 2,500 copies. And they sold this book, this deluxe edition. And this, very, this is very important because you couldn't do this before the internet. You couldn't talk to your fans directly. But now you can talk to your fans directly. There aren't a lot of intermediaries. Before, you had to talk to them through this little CD case. But suddenly, you can talk to them directly. And through this merchandise, they sold $1.6 million worth of merchandise in one week. And this is a very important change. And, and now, if you see Prince, he's charging hundreds of dollars for people to become fans on his site, and he's making millions from that. And this is a business model where you take from less people more money, and you use the music as your distribution and as your marketing. Because the problem is we've solved the delivery problem, but the discovery problem is harder, which is, means how do I get found by the, my fans? How do my fans find me? And because of the internet, the transaction cost between your fans and yourself has gotten lower and more flexible. So now you can come up with much more flexible business models, giving the fans what they're willing to pay for, authenticity and artifacts, rather than music. Um, and controlling and managing your fans is much more important now than trying to figure out this kind of marketing machine that we used to have. So Stephanie Gwen, when she had her baby, she released her photo under a Creative Commons license rather than working with a big firm like most people do. Obama released his photos under a Creative Commons license so that his fans could share the content and didn't have to work through some sort of press agency and talk to a bunch of lawyers. Um, Cory Doctorow allows his book to be downloaded for free, and he still sells books. And this is very simple math. If you have if you allow free download, obviously you're going to lose some sales, but you increase because a lot of people find out about the book they wouldn't have known. So it's very, very simple math. If your potential demand is zero and your de actual demand is maximum, then you shouldn't share your book because you'll lose sales. But if your actual demand is lower than your potential demand, it's often better to share your book because it might increase sales. So it's not an emotional discussion. It's a mathematical business decision about whether you should give your book away under a Creative Commons license. Now, I'm going to give a couple of very specific examples. There's a kind, this is a presentation from Ronaldo Limos, but there's a kind of music called Tecno Brega um, in Brazil. And this is a Tecno Brega party. And, and Brazilians love parties. And they're willing to pay a lot of money to go to these parties. 
but they're not willing to pay a lot of money for the, the music. And so what Technobrega does is they give their music, they go record the music, and because of the advances in music recording, it's very, very cheap, they give their music to the street vendors, the public buys these, this music, the artist doesn't get any money, but the artists that get famous through word of mouth get contacted by the concert halls, get sponsors from the sound systems, because these things are huge DJ contraptions that sponsor these parties, and, um, and then people get paid. And the thing is that this is the popular musicians are making over a million dollars a month. And this total billion, business is millions of dollars, and you actually have people funding this. And this is very important, because you, what you're doing is you're looking at the behavior of kids. They're not willing to pay for this, the street vendor D CDs, but they're willing to pay lots of money to go to these parties. And at the end of the party, they actually buy the authentic DVDs and CDs. So it's just a matter of saying, OK, there's a change in behavior. Instead of punishing that change in behavior, how do we go to where the kids are spending the money and make the money there instead. And I think it's just a very simple model. This isn't really Creative Commons, but it's a good example. This is Hatsune Miku, which is a, uh, it's, it's a kind of mu it's a It's called Vocaloid, which is basically um, you type in the lyrics, you type in the, uh, um, the, the notes, and it sings the music for you. And this company made this uh, Vocaloid software before. It's called part of what's called desktop music. But they went after the otaku anime market. And um, what they did was they created this character, which is supposed to be the one singing the song. And you can hear this is a computer-generated voice, right? But what he did, the guy did, which was very interesting, was he said, OK, well, I'm not going to take rights on this character. I'm going to create a website where all the illustrators and artists can do whatever they want with this character, which Disney or somebody would never do. So the whole bunch of illustrators started creating illustrations of this character. And then a bunch of people started music, making music out of this. And so this CD actually got to number two on the charts. And they all get to use this character for free, right? Except the people who make these little figurines that, that can be up to hundreds of dollars, they, get, they pay a merchandising fee. The music costs uh, hundreds of uh, over $100. And they've sold 40,000 units, where they normally sell 1,000. And then people have started creating modeling software and stuff like that to create this character. And then there's another weird, funky site called Nico Nico Doga in Japan, which is now more popular than YouTube, which is like YouTube. You upload videos, except you can type text on top of it. So what people did was they got together and started using this Vocaloid software, posting to Nico Nico Doga, using the characters without asking permission, and created this huge boom, this movement of. And so this scrolling stuff is basically people cheering or commenting or writing about this music. And by giving this character away, it suddenly created this huge community of people who use this character as kind of a focal point. So it's a platform. And when you talk to the CEO of this company, it's very interesting because he says that his uh, character, Hatsune Miku, is a protocol for communication. And it's very interesting. And he also said that a lot of this software dies out, but by allowing these derivatives to continue and continue in the community, he keeps selling software. And he's not the only one that's taking advantage of this. The Communist Party of Japan is a very unpopular party. It's a stodgy party. It's kind of smart. But what they did was they saw this huge movement of young people and this new behavior. And what they did was they put their video on Nico Nico Doga. And this is the, the head of the Communist Party of Japan speaking in front of the Diet about the problem of temporary workers. And suddenly, this show that no one used to watch on television became a huge hit among the kids, and there's a landslide of people joining the Communist Party. Now, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing, but they really had nothing to lose, unlike the ruling party. The ruling party would never allow kids to sort of graffiti all over their face, but now they're posting all their videos on Nico Nico Doga and have completely captured the hearts and minds of these young people. Again, by looking for the behavior change caused by the technology change and focusing there rather than on trying to push old media. And basically, I think it's a generation gap. So, so what's, what's happening, I'll just, I'm going to end with the last example. So when pagers came out in Japan, all the young girls actually started using these pagers, these Japanese high, sc high school girls and junior high school girls. This is, this is a little girl using a numerical pager to type to her their friends. The whole mobile movement in Japan started, was started by these little girls who were using pagers who were enterprise devices but took over those, that whole device and made it their own. And it eventually became the mobile phone market in Japan, which by revenue exceeds just about any other market. And this was only successful because the Japanese telephone companies, instead of being like, let's make enterprise products, they watched the behavior of these kids and tracked it. 
And so while it's the in instinct is to punish bad behavior, so this is the Grokster case where the Supreme Court of America banned P2P on Grokster. They were beating it up, but it had no effect on P2P file sharing, actually. And while I understand the, 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 how it makes you feel good to try to punish behavior that's making you lose money, I think the way you're going to make money is how is the technology changing the world? How does that change behavior? And how do I make money where that behavior is paying money rather than chasing money that isn't being made anymore? And this is what we need to think about, Loic, when we're thinking about our products. <laughs> and sorry for going over time. Thank you very much, Joy. Just one, one question before, before we break, like one minute. Uh, how do you convince the governments to, to you know, support this? Because they, the like, lobbies have everything to lose, right? To, uh, well, the I, lobbies protecting so the music, the current music industry. And you've done a few yeah. appointments uh, yesterday, right? Yes. How did it go? <laughs> well, I think the best is to make successful examples. Um, you know, I think that arguing with them isn't usually going is, to. Yeah. And so making products, making money, um, and then sharing the money. Um, which is, I think, the negotiation between Google and all the content industry will eventually they'll come to a deal, right? And I think also it's important for government to get out of the way. The success that the US Silicon Valley had was one, Silicon Valley was far away from government, all the way on the other coast. And basically, the, the government at the time said, we're going to get out of the way. Japan said they're, get, they're, they're saying no, but they let it go anyway. And the Europeans really stuck to the old CCITT, so it was slower starting here. And even in Italy and stuff, you still have in the 20s in terms of penetration. And so I think government has to loosen up a little bit. But I think really it's through making examples. Yeah, I think it, and these were great examples. Well, good luck for uh, convincing them. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, you. Joy, again. Um,